Welcome or welcome back to Gospel Simplicity. I'm your host, Austin Suggs, and here on Gospel Simplicity, we seek to bring simplicity out of theological and historical complexity. Today, I'm joined by the very Reverend Dr. Stephen DeYoung. He's pastor of Archangel Gabriel Orthodox Church in Lafayette, Louisiana. He's the host of the Whole Council of God podcast, as well as the co-host of the Lord of Spirits podcast. He's also written a number of books, and I've interviewed him on multiple of these books. He just keeps writing. Today, we're going to be talking about his book on the Apocrypha. But Father Stephen DeYoung, thank you so much for being here today. Good to be here. I'm so grateful to have you here. And I have to, so I was looking back on the channel and like I said, this is your third time on the channel and I think uh, less than that many years. I think the first interview was two years ago, then one year ago, uh, and then now. And so I'd be just genuinely curious. I mean, you're a pastor, you're doing these podcasts. Like, how do you write these books this fast? What's your writing process like? Well, part of it is I don't sleep much. Um the the other the other part is uh, I actually got from uh, Stephen King, who also is renowned for producing way more material than I do. The um, other Stephen, you know. Yeah, <laughs> and he said, uh, and I started doing this when I was working on my dissertation. Actually, he said um, the best way to approach it is you decide on a number of pages you're going to write a day. Okay. So you say, like, I'm going to write three pages a day of something. <laughs> right? yeah. And you just approach it that way. And when you're done with the three pages, you're done. And sometimes that's really work. And sometimes it just kind of flows out really quickly. But if you do that, even if you just do it on weekdays during the year, you can produce, you know, 750 pages a year. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that's, um, without you know, sitting up into the wee hours of the night. Um, so yeah, that's that's the the trick I learned. Nice. And if you do three pages and then don't sleep, you, you can probably get at least yeah. six done a day. And then <laughs> here we are. <laughs> well, that's fascinating. I really enjoyed your latest book on the Apocrypha. And I'd love to start just, I think it's always good to have everyone on the, on the same page, especially uh, with terminology. When, when you're referring to Apocrypha uh, in, in the book, and as we're talking about in the interview here, what do you mean? Because when I grew up, and I know this isn't what you mean it as, but Apocrypha essentially meant those books you're not supposed to read. And I know you're advocating anything but that. So when you say Apocrypha, what are you referring to? Yeah. Well, also sometimes, particularly in uh, Western discussions of the canon, meaning discussions between Roman Catholics and Protestants, the Apocrypha refers to the books that are different between the Roman Catholic and most Protestant uh, Old Testament. So it sort of refers to a particular small set of six books and sort of longer versions of a couple of other books. Uh, but I'm using it in the older sense of the term. So people have probably heard from History Channel documentaries or what have you that the word apocrypha means hidden or secret. That makes these books sound really super mysterious. Uh, which, yes, as you mentioned, puts off some people, uh, incredibly intrigues other people. You get these documentaries called Banned from the Bible or uh, this kind of thing. Uh, but really, while Apocrypha can mean hidden or secret, the real idea was that, particularly in the East, in early canonical discussions, there were three categories into which these texts were divided. Uh, there were books that were read in public, meaning books that were read in the church, in the services, in the liturgy of the church, which are what we would call canonical. Uh, there were books not to be read, which are what we would call heretical, <laughs> right, that had actually bad, misleading, harmful ideas in them. And then there was a middle category of books to be read in the home or books to be read privately. And... The word apocrypha is really being used to mean hidden in the sense of private, right? This is not something you do in public. And this middle category of texts were texts that were considered important, but for various reasons, and it varies from text to text. Sometimes it's because there are both good things and not so good things in the text. Uh, sometimes it's because... Uh, the, the text might be confusing or easily misunderstood. Uh, 
there there's well most of the book of enoch that i know we're going to talk about a little more later if you just read a chapter from it in front of a congregation almost nobody there would know what to do with it it would just seem weird <laughs> um and so uh that category was important because especially in the ancient world literacy rates were very low so anyone who was able to read privately uh, first of all, was going to be someone who is highly educated, most likely highly educated by the church. To have access to those texts, they were going to be in or around a monastery or a bishop's library. Uh, and so the people who would have access to those kind of texts were the people who were prepared to sort of read them, sift them for what, what ideas are good and what are not so good, uh, know what to do with some of the more esoteric and wild and strange uh, texts and passages. Uh, and so the book is really aimed at being an introduction to those texts to try to help modern readers. We've, we've overcome the literacy problem for the most part, uh, at least most of the people who are going to pick up uh, the book. But there's still a lot that seems very weird and strange and hard to hard to understand and hard to apply uh, in a lot of those texts. Yeah, and I think you do a really great job in the book of not just showing kind of a background to these texts, but also what import they have for us today, which we'll talk a bit about as we go through uh, the the interview today. But I think just people will really enjoy the book. And it's, it's nice because, you know, you can read it cover to cover. But you can also kind of use it as a guide to various texts, I think, as well. But before we jump into the individual texts, I kind of want to just uh, maybe double click on the idea of the three categories of um, the, the books that are to be read in church, read at home, uh, not read at all, because I think it shines some light on just the orthodox approach to the canon, which might be a bit new to some of my listeners. Recently, I've done several videos on the canon uh, with Protestant and Catholic uh, guests, and while they have different canons, they share in common this sense of like a binary of like, it's either canonical or it's not canonical. And the question is just who has the right list of what is canonical. But in the introduction to your book, you introduce a concept that's a little different than that. It's, uh, there's a bit, I don't know if like more gray is the way to say it, but it's not as binary. And so could you maybe just give the listeners a bit of context on the way that the Orthodox Church has historically approached this question of canon? Yeah, so um, the fact that we have this middle category of books to be read privately, right off the bat changes the discussion. Because if we're discussing... 1st Maccabees or 3rd Maccabees or 4th Maccabees, <laughs> to give increasingly controversial examples. Um, we're not arguing about, is this text Bible or is this text heretical? Uh, we're discussing, okay, well, this church has a tradition of reading from this book publicly. This other church doesn't and thinks it's to be read privately. And so that allows that, well, it has allowed historically for churches, and this really even includes the Western church uh, far later than most people think, um, to have kind of a dot, more dotted line there, uh, where, for example, if um, a Greek church is reading from 3rd Maccabees and a Latin speaking church only has first and second Maccabees. Uh, they don't. That's not something they need to fight over or divide over, or split from each other over. They just have different traditions in that regard. And uh, though they're not in communion with the Orthodox Church anymore, while say the Ethiopian Church was in full communion with the Orthodox churches, they still had their massive Old Testament canon. Uh, and so that changes the discussion. Uh, as I said, in the West, that went on far later. That's why uh, it's become common uh, for Protestants to refer to the difference between the Roman Catholic and most Protestant canons uh, 
as the Apocrypha. Because originally the argument was, no, these are Apocrypha. These are books to be read privately. They aren't part of the canon. As opposed to uh, the Roman Catholic position, particularly post-Council of Trent, uh, that they were that they were canonical. Uh, but that, as you say, that discussion has changed over the century since the Protestant Reformation. But even in the West, it was at Trent, that was the first place where an Old Testament canon was set out by Rome. Before that, uh, including some of Martin Luther's opponents, his debate opponents in the Reformation, uh, endorsed what became the normal Protestant canon, the canon of the Hebrew Bible. Uh, so that was still a live debate in the West at the time of the Reformation. There were people on both sides of that. And that ultimately stems from people forget that Western North Africa, the church there was also Latin speaking. So the Church of Alexandria that was over all of North Africa the western portion spoke Latin, the eastern portion around Alexandria spoke Greek. And so there w was more than one Latin tradition in, in the church in late antiquity. In general, North African Latin-speaking churches tended to favor the Alexandrian canon and have the larger the tradition of using the larger Old Testament. And uh, those in Western Europe tended toward the uh, canon of the Hebrew Bible. But in both cases, those were traditions they received ultimately out of the local Judaisms. Uh, so Alexandrian Judaism had used a wider spread of texts, had been more willing to use Greek texts than Palestinian Judaism, for example. Uh, and Ethiopian Judaism, likewise, the, the way that the Ethiopian church got that sort of massive Old Testament canon is they inherited it from Ethiopian Judaism. And that tends to be the case as you look at these churches from place to place. The canon of the Judaism that was operating there at the dawn of Christianity tends to become the functional Old Testament of the church. And again, this was not something that was really fought and divided over because we're talking about, well, we have a tradition of reading this publicly. You don't. You have copies. You read them privately, right? You learn from them. You just don't have that tradition of reading them, them publicly. Uh, I think a lot of canon discussions have this idea that isn't true to history, that that was authoritatively dictated at some point in Nicaea or somewhere else, uh, which, of course, it just wasn't yeah and that's really interesting there kind of the the local but also kind of liturgical differences right because we're talking about whether you're reading these in church or you're reading them at home which again it, i think when you don't have the misunderstanding that i had you know growing up of like these books are bad or something it's they're all profitable books it's just this the setting in which they might be most profitable it's also interesting to note there that it's not that necessarily diversity was the later development in these traditions, if I'm hearing you correctly, but it's actually coming from the, the pre-Christian times, like uh, the Judaisms in the area, what books they're using, and then those are adopted. And so diversity had been kind of baked in from the beginning there. And in some places that was much later turned into a more strict kind of codification. And then in other places, this was allowed to kind of uh, remain uh, of some differences of whether this, uh, whether different books are read in church. That's really fascinating. I hope it'll be helpful for people as they think about this concept of the canon, which is uh, an endless debate, it seems, uh, for many people online. Um, but I think that's enough on the canon for now. I, I want to get into these books themselves because I, I think that's the most fun and exciting part of your work. And I think many of my listeners will be intrigued just to learn more because, like you said, these hidden books, if you will, do have this kind of aura about them of like intrigue. Like, what is in these? What have I been missing out on? What do I need to know? What was everyone hiding from me? Um, depending on the flavor of it. But let's start in kind of Second Temple Judaism era um, with the books of Enoch. I mean, these are probably, if people are interested in these conversations, if they listen to Lord of Spirits, I'm sure they've heard of it. Uh, but there's 
a whole like very large corpus of Enochic literature. And so it's not like we can just say like the one book of Enoch, like we're, we're talking about a lot here and hopefully you can help us sort through that a bit. So when we, when someone hears, whether on your podcast or in a history channel documentary, they hear something about the books of Enoch, what is being referred to there? This video is brought to you in part by Faithful Counseling. Faithful Counseling is an organization of Christian counselors that exists to help you get the help you need. You can find them by going to faithfulcounseling.com slash gospel simplicity. And when you use that link, which you can find in the description down below, you will get 10% off your first month and they'll pair you up with a licensed mental health counselor in under 48 hours. Once you've been paired up with a counselor, you can reach them via instant message, phone call, video call, and more. I think you will really enjoy this, and I think it could be the first step on your journey to greater mental health. And mental health problems affect all of us, religious, non-religious, old, young, every demographic feels the weight of mental health. But there are resources available, and you don't need to go through this alone, which is why I encourage you to reach out to the amazing people at Faithful Counseling by using that link, faithfulcounseling.com slash gospel simplicity, and taking your first step towards healing and wholeness in your mental health. Yeah, so a tradition develops um, in written form uh, by at least the third century BC. And there's a lot of good evidence that not only oral traditions and that sort of thing, but also probably some early written traditions predate that. But uh, a chunk of what's called First Enoch or the Book of Enoch dates to the, the third century BC, at least. Uh, there comes to be this literature. It's referred to as Enochic literature because most of it focuses on the figure of Enoch in the genealogy of Seth uh, in Genesis, who is the figure who we're told walked with God and was no more. He's sort of the exception in the genealogy to the, the real sweep of the genealogy is driving home that after Adam, all of his descendants, even the righteous ones die. And Enoch is the exception to that. And so very early that's understood in all of the uh, Jewish sources we have as being Enoch being taken into heaven, usually paralleled with Elijah being taken up into heaven uh, without dying. And so Enoch becomes this figure for apocalyptic literature. In apocalyptic literature, we hear apocalypse. We think zombie apocalypse or something else. We think the end of the world. Uh, but apocalyptic literature the word apocalypse really means revelation. That's where the title of the book of Revelation comes from. Something being revealed, something being uncovered. Uh, and most apocalyptic literature, early Jewish apocalyptic literature, is not about the end of the world. Uh, I would say that includes the book of Revelation, frankly, at least not primarily about the end of the world, but is about revealing what is going on in the world that maybe we... Uh, don't see from our perspective. So another perspective, usually a heavenly perspective is given to help the reader sort of reorient how they think about their world and their life and history and what's going on around them and see it in a new context. And so Enoch is a figure who is taken out of the human world into the heavenly realms, uh, becomes a vehicle for that because he could, of course then be taken to see the heavens, the underworld, Hades, Sheol, uh, angelic beings, right? He can, he can sort of be given this tour of the cosmos, this tour of history up to his point, uh, and even then a tour of history unfolding beyond that, that can be used to, again, try to reorient uh, the reader. And then I say most of the Anakic literature revolves around Enoch because then you also get a few trailing texts here and there that don't directly involve the figure of Enoch, but which do uh, deal with themes and that kind of thing that come out of that Anakic literature, but sort of go in a trajectory off of it. So an example of that is like the Book of the Giants at Qumran, um, 
isn't really focused on Enoch per se, but the theme of the giants, the Nephilim, as it's understood in that book, seems to come directly from uh, the Anakic literature. So I think one of the things that really interests people about the books of Enoch is that at, depending on how you read the Old Testament and perhaps where you're reading, it's not always clear like how full-fleshed of a picture you're going to get of, say, something like the Divine Council or kind of this spiritual, like the heavenly vision of what's going on on Earth. We get glimpses of it, but maybe not as much as some people uh, would like for their own curiosity or for their own edification or for whatever. But I think in the books of Enoch, we get a much fuller-fledged picture of what's going on in the heavenly realms. And so what are a few of the things that people might learn from reading the books of Enoch about kind of this heavenly view of earth um, or in kind of this tour of the heavens in the underworld? Yeah. So um, there, there are several really interesting things Um, in terms of, for example, in Sheol in, in Hades, uh, Enoch depicts, as in part of his vision, he sees that there are these four caves where uh, the departed are. Uh, One of them is uh, the righteous. One of them is the wicked. Uh, One of them is uh, what we would call martyrs, starting with uh, Abel. And one of them is people who sort of died in ignorance. Um, and there is sort of an eschatological connection that's made there because Enoch asks, Enoch is sort of taken on this tour by the, the seven archangels, um, Michael and Gabriel, who most people are familiar with, Raphael and Uriel, who fewer people are familiar with, and then some others who probably nobody's familiar with. Um, but he's taken on this tour and he asks about the caves uh, and he's told that, well, the cave where everyone is here in Sheol, everyone is here in Hades, he says, the cave where the righteous are and where the cave where the martyrs are has this spring of water, which the others don't have. Uh, and he's told that on at the end of days, what's going to happen is that the righteous there are going to be taken to paradise. Uh, the... Uh, wicked there are going to be uh, thrown into the lake of fire with the rebellious angels. Uh, Interestingly, those who died in ignorance are going to sort of stay there uh, in Hades. And the martyrs are going to be uh, taken into the heavens. Uh, And you can see while not in all its details, but you can see a lot of early Christian eschatology reflected there. Uh, you can see where some of these ideas come from, but even bits of that are, are reflected in the New Testament. So in the parable of the rich man and Lazarus, uh, the rich man asks Lazarus to dip his finger in the water Abraham's bosom, there's apparently water there uh, and not where uh, the rich man is. Uh, So that, I think, is an example that shows how a lot of traditions surrounding the text of what we would call the canonical Old Testament end up getting preserved in this literature. Uh, The interpretations, the understandings, And when you get to the New Testament, we see the apostles sort of receiving the Old Testament within that context. And so sometimes they'll speak very casually about details that seem to come from this literature. I would say they don't come from this literature, but this literature is sort of our earliest written record. Uh, of those traditions in which the text was being interpreted and taught uh, and uh, and those sort of things. And of course, the the most famous thing that comes out of uh, a part of uh, First Enoch or the Book of Enoch, which is itself uh, an accumulation, a knitting together of several preceding books of Anakic literature that have all been kind of pulled together into one big text, 
but it's very obvious if you try to just read through it that you're dealing with different sections that have been stuck together. Uh, the first one called the Book of the Watchers. This is the most well-known thing about Elanca literature is the the uh, traditions about the Watchers, these angelic beings who in some way have intercourse with human women and produce the giants, sort of as, as uh, the understanding of Genesis 6 verses 1 through 4, sort of the larger story surrounding, uh, surrounding that that draws in um, draws in, but also corrects and changes preceding Mesopotamian traditions. Um, and it transforms them sort of in the way that the story of the flood and Noah in Genesis transforms the flood myths that preexisted it, uh, in Mesopotamia. Um, and that I think was the primary purpose of a lot of this literature. Although some of it was also what we would call sectarian. And for that, I'm thinking primarily in First Enoch, one of the sections is all about the calendar, all about laying out the yearly calendar. Uh, and that seems to have been directly related to some splits within uh, ancient Judaism. So what's called the Qumran community, the community that produced the Dead Sea Scrolls, their reason for splitting with the Pharisees uh, in Palestine was uh, over the uh, issue of the calendar. Uh, because the Anakic calendar is 364 days. You have three 30-day periods and then a one-day sort of feast day in between those blocks of 90 days. So you end up with a 364-day calendar, which means that all the feasts fall on the same day of the week every year. It all looks very beautiful. We know it doesn't accord with how the Earth goes around the sun now because we have better observations. But because it was mathematically perfect, certain groups within Judaism, like the one that produced the Dead Sea Scrolls, said this is mathematically perfect and that's the proof that it comes from God. Whereas these other calendars, you have to keep adding, you know, on the traditional Jewish calendar that was the Pharisaic calendar, you have to add a whole month every so often. They said, well, look, that proves that this was invented by humans because it's so imperfect, right? You have to keep correcting it all the time. This one is mathematically perfect and comes from God. And so it's not surprising that First Enoch is the second most common text found among the Dead Sea Scrolls. Uh, the Dead Sea Scrolls, the most common text. This is a common way scholars judge what the most important texts were. Because, of course, making copies was a very expensive and uh, time-consuming process at that time in history. So if you find a library of texts and there are a dozen copies of one text and a fragmentary copy of the other text. In general, you're going to conclude, well, this one with the 12 copies that are in good shape must have been much more important to them. They spent more time dealing with it. Uh, so number one among the Dead Sea Scrolls is Genesis. Number two is the Book of Enoch. Number three is the Book of Exodus. Number four is uh, the Book of Jubilees, another work of Anakic literature. So in some cases, these texts, were held to be of such importance for various reasons that uh, there were these segmentations in Judaism uh, dealing with them, or not really caused by them, but that they reflect. That's really interesting, and it's just uh, <laughs> a little tidbit there that the, the church, even I suppose before the church or however you want to think about uh, that relationship, which is another can of worms, but has always been debating calendars. There's nothing new <laughs> about uh, calendar debates, which is just a bit funny to me. Um, before we move on from the Book of Enoch, I, I want to look at two things. One, I want to uh, talk about kind of just the, the modern import for us, like how Christians today can, can learn from this, uh, in addition to what we've said about how we can kind of flesh out maybe... Uh, how the disciples saw the world and how uh, Second Temple Jews saw the world. But before we get there, I do want to just ask one question, because at the beginning you made a note of, if you were to just read a passage from Enoch and Church, probably no one would understand what's going on. And so if someone comes out of this and 
you know, they don't necessarily want to read it in church, but they want to sit down and read it. What are just like a couple pieces of advice you'd have for them so that they're not just completely and utterly lost? Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, I mean, this is really one of the reasons why I wrote the book. I don't want to say, well, buy my book, but, um, but they should, but it is one of the reasons because very commonly I have people ask me cause we'll refer to not just the book of Enoch, but, um, uh, in fact, on Lord of Spirits, we refer to the Book of Enoch less than some folks think we do. Uh, but uh, other texts, too, uh, that are reflected in the book. Um, people will come and ask, what's a good translation? Where should I read? How do I read this? Uh, and so I kind of wrote the book to kind of give, give that orientation. Um, because it can be, as I said, especially like First Enoch because it's all compiled together, you know, the, the book of the watchers, which is the first part deals with the giants. That's relatively approachable. I mean, it seems a little weird, but it is narrative. Um, then when you get into the section about the calendar, it starts talking about the 12 gates of the sun, you know, and <laughs> that's, that's referring to very detailed astronomical observations of the path the sun takes through the sky at different times of year. So, I mean, it is interesting, but uh, yeah, if I just read it publicly, blank stares, right? Um, because, because it's so detailed and there's not uh, a framework for it. Um, and so I, I think it's also important. We have to remember that the people who, as I mentioned, the people who are able to read this privately in the past, were people who were very well educated already. And the best thing to help you read this literature is to be really familiar with the canonical literature. Um, if you try to read the Book of Jubilees without being very familiar with the books of Genesis and Exodus, you, you can take it all kinds of weird places. And by all kinds of weird places, I mean aliens, right, whatever. Uh, that's because it's, these are really, uh, while they contain traditions that kind of flesh this out, these are really commentaries in a lot of cases. They're not commentaries in the genre that we're used to reading commentaries. So for example, Jubilees basically retells the stories of Genesis and Exodus, uh, but adds all these details or fleshes things out in different ways or explains different things in the text, you know, that aren't made explicit in the canonical text. And so you really need to be familiar with the canonical text. And that includes later canonical texts. So if you're really familiar with the New Testament as well, then, for example, when you read First Enoch, you're going to pick up on things Oh, right. That's like this, you know, like the parable of the rich man and Lazarus that I mentioned, you know, that, that reminds me of this, that St. Paul says, or that reminds me of this in, in, uh, St. Matthew's gospel, there are details like when Christ in St. Matthew's gospel or the lake of fire prepared for the devil and his angels, uh, you don't see a re any references to the lake of fire anywhere in the canonical, anybody's canonical old Testament under those words that seems to be referencing this Anakic tradition about, about the lake of fire. Um, so you'll pick up on, you'll pick up on those things. Uh, whereas if you're just delving into it, you won't <laughs> right without that. Uh, and these aren't sort of alternative books that sort of bad view, that banned from the Bible view that so, at some point somebody got together and, voted on what books should be in the Bible. And these were excluded because, you know, the secrets no one was meant to know and hidden. Approaching these books that way, again, is not going to get you to any place helpful. Right. It's it's really being grounded in in the scriptures is probably the best, even much more than buying my book. Although if you want to buy my book, great. But <laughs> Uh, much more than buying my book, being really grounded in the scriptures w is what would really help you understand this, the way the authors and the original readers were. And it seems like there's kind of this symbiotic relationship between being grounded in scriptures will help you understand these books better, 
and as you understand these books better, it'll shed perhaps new light on the scriptures, right? As you're going through, like you mentioned, uh, in St. Matthew's Gospel or uh, St. Paul, like you're beginning to see, oh, like there, there's a link here. Just like so often, you know, you'll see those little notes in your Bible, maybe where like in the New Testament, it's refer- cross-referencing to the old. You're beginning to make more of those bridges, which I think only helps deepen our understanding. So I imagine that's one of the main benefits, right, to reading this. And I also imagine that many of much of my audience won't need any encouragement to go out and look at this. I think they're the type of people that will be excited about this if they haven't already. Um, but just like as, as we kind of turn the corner from the books of Enoch and we, we go forward to the New Testament Apocrypha, what kind of encouragement would you give to those who are maybe on the fence of, should I check this out? Like what, what are some of the things that they could possibly walk away from reading the book of Enoch that would help deepen their faith or un- their understanding as maybe an encouragement of what they could get out of this? Yeah, um, I've with the Anakic literature in particular. Um, really, honestly, actually, now that I say that, with a lot of this, uh, as we've already mentioned, there was a lot of diversity in Judaism. At uh, by the time we get to the first century uh, A.D. and a lot of that, not all, uh, less of it than people think. I'm learning. But uh, a lot of it, that gets pruned away by what happens with the destruction of the temple, the destruction of Jerusalem. Um, only certain groups, primarily the Pharisees and some, other, some others that get incorporated, sort of survive that. And of course, Christianity. But um, by the time you get to the first century, there's this huge diversity in Judaism. And a lot of times we read the New Testament as over against or emerging from, depending on people's perspectives, one particular idea of what Judaism was. And if that Judaism isn't anachronistically based on the synagogue down the street from wherever we live, it's based on a kind of reconstruction of Palestinian Pharisaism. And we just sort of assume that's the background for everything in the New Testament. Uh, But there is this richness and different texts in the New Testament, the general epistles, so 1st, 2nd Peter, uh, 1st, 2nd, 3rd John, Jude very obviously, draw much more on Anakic literature and some of these other traditions than they do on what we would now call the Pharisaic tradition. Uh, Other texts very clearly are drawing on the Pharisaic Jewish tradition. And there's mishmash in between because these lines weren't, uh, these lines weren't sort of rock solid, right? It wasn't like, oh, this person's a Pharisee. Therefore, they have no idea what any of this Enoch stuff is about. And this person is practicing, quote unquote, Anakic Judaism. And so they don't read the Torah. Um, that Those are way too hard, fast lines. There's a lot of mixing. Uh, St. Paul came out of uh, Palestinian Pharisaism very clearly, but incorporates a lot of things from other Jewish traditions in his, in his writings in various places. And I think... If we're reading the New Testament only in the context of, at best, a slice of first century Judaism, we're really missing out on a lot of the richness of the New Testament. And Anakic Judaism uh, is... I, 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 I want to say it's easily the second most popular. It may have, I mean... We can't do a survey retroactively, but if you take into account the Jewish communities in Alexandria, like the Qumran community, it rivaled sort of the the Pharisaic tradition. Uh, definitely in places like Alexandria, it predominated even over uh, Pharisaic Judaism. So missing that component, we're missing a lot in terms of the New Testament, in terms of uh, 
the religion of the apostles, not intentionally plugging my other book, but in terms of how they, they read and interpreted the scriptures and that background. And I think almost every modern Christian would say, yeah, you can't understand the new Testament outside the context of the old Testament and the old Testament tradition is far broader than a lot of us have come to believe by our modern Western upbringing. Yeah, I think that's super helpful for people as they're thinking through this. And it is fascinating to think about the diversity of ancient Judaism. And I loved that image you talked about of a slice or maybe even like less than a slice. If we're only looking at this kind of one narrow strand, which ended up becoming more predominant. So that was really helpful. And I hope people are encouraged to go check out uh, the, these works to deepen their understanding of what's going on there. I want to pivot to the New Testament. We'll spend a little bit less time on each of these. Um, they're much shorter works, and um, I wanted to give some good time to Enoch because I know that really interests people. But in the New Testament period, we also have a, a real flowering of apocryphal works. Um, and I think we have probably, you know, also in the Old Testament as well, like or the that period of time. Um, but especially in the New Testament period, it seems that we have uh, a lot that are apocryphal and then a lot that are outside the scope of that. And so we're not going to talk too much about those. Um, but to kind of transition from the books of Enoch, which have kind of this apocalyptic character, uh, let's, let's talk a little bit about the Apocalypse of Peter. I'm not sure this is a book that as many people will be familiar with, um, but the Apocalypse of Peter, what's going on there and, and why might we care about that? Yeah, so the Apocalypse of St. Peter is a text from most likely the early, it seems the early second century AD. So it's a very early Christian text. Um, and it is, a, it is a Christian text. It purports to be an apocalyptic vision of uh, St. Peter, who is taken uh, on one of these sort of cosmic tours, focusing in this case on the underworld on Hades. And uh, the Apocalypse of St. Peter, the reason why they might be interested in it first is, is that it shows up actually in a number of early canon lists we have of the New Testament. Uh, so there were very early Christian communities that were publicly reading from the Apocalypse of St. Peter. And it's usually occupying the spot i guess you might say that was later occupied by the apocalypse of saint john it took a long time for the book of revelation to be sort of fully broadly embraced in the church it was really the fifth century in the west the sixth century in the east that it gained widespread uh sort of uh, acceptance uh, part of the framing of uh, my book is around this uh, list of canonical texts made by St. Nicephorus of Constantinople in the ninth century. And even in the ninth century, he says that there were communities, Christian churches that hadn't accepted really uh, the book of Revelation. There were still sort of some holdouts who were kind of wary of it. But very early on, uh, there were churches that were sort of using uh, the apocalypse of St. Peter in a similar way. And the Apocalypse of St. Peter, its tour of the underworld, is sort of our earliest example, Christian example of uh, a kind of literature that become very popular in the West, uh, which describes the uh, punishments, consequences, whatever language you want to use, the state of uh, those condemned to Hades after death for wickedness various forms of wickedness and then how that sort of bears fruit or is punished uh, in the afterlife. And so that becomes a huge influence on later, late antique and, and medieval Western texts like the vision of St. Paul. And then obviously if you read it, you'll see the connections to like Dante's Inferno almost immediately. Uh, in terms of sort of how it's it's structured. So while, while it didn't find a place in anybody's New Testament canon, uh, Apocalypse of St. Peter gives us a very early window into uh, 
the understanding of what now gets called the afterlife or eschatology uh, by very early, very early Christians. It gives us this very early window. Uh, and because of Bart Ehrman's recent book and some other things, that's become very controversial. Uh, and uh, in part because of the lack of familiarity with this literature. Uh, there are a lot of arguments you can make about heaven, hell, the afterlife, the life of the world to come, the bodily resurrection, just working from the canonical New Testament. But part of what this literature does is it shows us, well, okay, I can read the New Testament that way, but is that how the first Christians read it? Is that how early Christians read it and understood it in their context? The people who the apostles wrote these letters to, how did they understand and interpret them? And for me, at least, that gives some guardrails, right, to interpretation of when, when am I coming up with something new and weird and when am I in sort of the mainstream of uh, the Christian tradition? Yeah, that is a really helpful um, use of this literature, right? To see how, just like Enoch, you can look at it as a commentary, though this isn't necessarily a commentary, it at least shows you kind of the intellectual milieu, if you will, like the, the way in which people are thinking about these concepts so that when someone makes claims that, you know, maybe the early Christians thought about this totally different than we thought, we can look at this early literature and say, well, at least, you know, people at this time seem to be thinking in this way. You make a note of this in your book, and I want to just highlight it here. Um, the Apocalypse of Peter. It, it has the, the name of Peter and uh, some of these other books that you cover. They'll have the names of people like Enoch does, right? Um, Enoch did not write the books of Enoch, and we don't think that Peter wrote the Apocalypse of Peter. And to some people, that is like a major red uh, red flag. They get really worried that, oh, like these books, they have lying authorship or something like that. So therefore, we can't trust them. To those people who are thinking like that, just maybe briefly, why should that not be of such concern to us? Why did they maybe think differently about um, what we'd call like pseudepigrapha, I think, right? Um, than perhaps some people think today. Right, right. So we tend to, this is actually a very postmodern way to read, but, uh, and I won't go into all that, but we tend to approach texts as saying, okay, this text is making claims. And I need to verify these claims. Uh, and therefore, right off the bat, this book claims to be written by St. Peter, St. James, Enoch. Uh, it was not. Therefore, this book is making false claims. This, is, this book is lying. This text is lying. Uh, and that even is a very narrow way to approach literature from a modern perspective. So we have genres like fiction and even historical fiction. Historical fiction may be a really good example. So someone may write a work of historical fiction about some period in Abraham Lincoln's life. And in the context of that, obviously they're fleshing things out at very least can't be verified, right? What what are the thoughts that are going through Abraham Lincoln's head? What what does he say to his wife or his, his son on a particular day? Um, how did he feel about this or that, you know? Um, and we don't look at that when we read that work of historical fiction as the author lying to us, right? He's making things up and lying to us, right? Um, and we would even say, sometimes with those with works of fiction, either pure fiction or like historical fiction, this book is saying something that's true, right? This, this book helped me understand the Civil War from a different perspective or Lincoln's presidency or whatever it's about, ancient Rome, right? I understood it from a different perspective. It gave me a different feel for it from reading this book, right? It sort of it shaped my understanding without claiming, oh no, every word of this is true, <laughs> right? Uh, every word of Shakespeare's Julius Caesar is true. That's exactly what everybody said during all of those events. N no one's claiming 
So the language I used about Enoch is kind of deliberate that the figure of Enoch is used as a, as a vehicle to tell a certain story and to say certain things. Uh, and he's apt for that because of what we know about him, that he's taken up into heaven, right? And so he can become a vehicle to say true things, right, about our life. One major section of the, the book of Enoch that we didn't mention before is called the animal apocalypse. And it's <laughs> that sounds like some kind of horrible hunting incident, but it's actually... Uh, the history of Israel as it unfolds in the Old Testament up to the period when when these Anakic texts were being written, described using animals. So different figures of the Old Testament are represented by different animals. And it's presented as a prophecy because from Enoch's perspective, that would have been a prophecy. From the author and the original reader's perspective, it's history. Uh, but Enoch's prophecy, quote unquote, prophecy here becomes this vehicle to tell this story in a different way and to give these different insights into it. And the original readers were in on this. They, they understood this, this genre. Uh, they understood that, you know, yes, this is, this is a vehicle. Now you do find a few cases, for example, with, with, church fathers and other early Christian writers talking about uh, the book of Enoch. It's just like Tertullian who in a lot of ways was the first fundamentalist, right? If you look at a lot of his, you read like his on the clothing of women, you read like his, uh, was very much about, you know, what does Athens have to do with Jerusalem? Everything worldly is bad, right? Shun all of that. Uh, he's the one who, because he likes the book of Enoch, makes these kind of strained, tortured arguments that Enoch actually wrote the book of Enoch. And and uh, Noah had a copy with him on the ark. He literally argues that. Uh, because, you know, no, this has to be very literally true. So someone of that bent did make those arguments about some of these texts. But for the most part, that's not the case. Uh, St. Augustine, for example, when he's commenting on the fact that the Epistle of Jude quotes the book of Enoch, says, well, St. Jude quotes this as Enoch having really said it. So there must be some contents of the book of Enoch that have an authentic historical pedigree. But there's no way to know for him in the 5th century AD... He, he argues there's no way for us to know now which it, what it goes back to Enoch and what doesn't, you know, if, if anything, beyond that one line in St. Jude's Epistle. So that shouldn't be a huge concern, right? So he, he's kind of in, on it in a different way, right? His view of the authority of the Epistle of St. Jude requires him to say certain things, but beyond that, he's like, look, this... That's not what that is, and that's not what it's doing. So that, that shouldn't be a huge obstacle to us. I think historical fiction is a good example. You can use a genre. You can use an important historical figure as a vehicle to tell a story uh, without, even, without claiming that every detail of the story you're telling is 100% historically accurate, which isn't a phrase they would even be familiar with. Yeah, I, that's a helpful note there as well. Like we have this view of history of now we we have like video cameras like we're using for this right now where you can have this like video footage of history and we can say like this is what happened. Um, th that wasn't on offer for them. And so even the way you might think about history would be a little different. But I think it's really helpful also to think about genre here, right? There's, there's certain agreements almost made between writer and author in a given genre that if you were out to write like a modern historical writing and you put things in that were your take and using the people as a vehicle, people might be rightly kind of upset, like, hey, that you're going beyond your sources here. But if you're reading a historical fiction or any other type of genre, you're going to set different expectations. And so I think as people go through this, they needn't be worried that, you know, uh, like Peter didn't write this, therefore this is all bad. Like, let's, let's, be a little more nuanced there and think about what that might mean. So thanks for that. I think that's a helpful note. 
I, I want to just briefly look at, at two more before we wrap up here um, to just give people a little sampling. Again, in your book, there's so much more that people can go through so many other instances and they can get such great background and so many places to then go run and uh, look into these things in, in the primary texts. But the two I want to look at uh, quickly are Shepherd of Hermas and the Proto-Evangelium of James. Uh, first, the, the Shepherd of Hermas. This is one that if people have read through like a collection of the Apostolic Fathers, they might have seen in there. Um, and I remember when reading through the Apostolic Fathers, I did it like over a winter break once and I it's going really well. It's like, oh, this is great. You've got like Ignatius and Polycarp and like, ah, oh, this is all really good. Then you get to the shepherd and I'm like, I, I don't know what's going on here, but I said I was going to finish all of these, so I'm going to finish it. <laughs> but it, it can be a little more difficult. And so what's going on there and what might people uh, pull out of that? Yeah, yeah, it is very, <clears throat> very different. So yeah, when, when you're reading like the epistles of St. Ignatius, like you say, or the epistle of St. Polycarp to uh, the Philippians, we're in a biblical genre, right? We, epistles, okay, we got that, right? It's a letter from a church leader to the church. You follow that. Uh, whereas uh, the Shepherd of Hermas is a series of, the record of a series of prophetic visions uh, by a very early Christian prophet in the, the mid second century. And that right off the bat, even that framing will raise questions for a lot of people like Christian prophet in the second century AD, uh, right off the bat. Um, that's one of the reasons though, I think it's important to read, read this literature is, um, there has been, um, and I won't go into why I think it is right now, cause that takes us down a rabbit trail, but there's been this kind of iron wall dropped between the end of the New Testament. Almost everybody thinks Revelation of St. John is the last book written of the New Testament. If you don't, whatever you think was. Iron wall between that and then everything else ever written by a Christian. Um, and to the point that we don't even need to take those other those other things into account at all. So we can form our view on the role of prophecy in the early church just by how we interpret, say, first and second Corinthians, without acknowledging the fact that in the second century this was considered to be a phenomenon that was still going on. Um that's sort of irrelevant to our case. But I, I think it has to be. Uh, because the Shepherd of Hermas was, is again, a text that, like the Apocalypse of St. Peter, shows up on some early canon lists. Uh, shows up at Codex Sinaiticus, one of the oldest sort of full Christian Bibles we have. Shepherd of Hermas is at the end of the New Testament, sort of tacked on. Um, so even if it wasn't, I mean, you can't, I don't think you can argue based on the context of a particular codex of a particular manuscript for the uh, scribes view of canon. Because often we find all kinds of things in the texts, those texts like prayers, liturgical things inserted because they were being used in a church context. But it does show that that was held in high regard, that the Shepherd of Hermas was, was added on there, uh, even if they didn't hold it to be part of the New Testament. Uh, it was held in very high regard. And that, again, entails that they had a certain view of the function of prophecy within the church ongoing past the close uh, of the New Testament. Um, and because of that, because we're dealing with visions you have a, and prophetic material, you have the same kind of interpretive issues that you have with the prophets in the Old Testament, with the book of Revelation, in that you have a lot of imagery, uh, a lot of, frankly, poetry, uh, and and that kind of thing that that doesn't lend itself to sort of a very literal approach. And I critique a little bit in the section on the Shepherd of Hermas, folks who have taken a literal, very literal approach. So there are people who go to the Shepherd of Hermas like, Okay, where does he stand in, in the Christological debates of the 5th century? It's like, well, he's in the 2nd century, first of all. 
So he's not weighing in on any of those things. But also, you're kind of trying to sift through poetry to find like a, a propositional doctrinal statement, and that doesn't work real well either. Um, so, but especially the church around Rome, uh, our earliest sources say that the the author was a close relative of the Bishop of Rome around 155. Uh, so um, this was a very authoritative and important text in terms of how they understood uh, the ongoing role of prophecy in the church and shows us how they interpreted, particularly around the figure of Christ and his ongoing relationship to the early Christian communities. Yeah, I think that's, again, we're going back to genre here, right? Like trying to get those propositional truths out of this poetic language might not be the best way to go about it. Plus, kind of anachronistically reading uh, fifth century debates into a second century text. There's a lot just of good hermeneutical uh, advice there that you gave. Um, but it's a really interesting book, I think, for people as they they sift through uh, the apostolic fathers, especially, right? That it's it's a collection of works that people should read and that this will be one that will be more difficult i think for people but also very rewarding and it's interesting to see that it was tacked on to some of these codexes or codices um and that it at least shows that it, it was valued by people at that time the last work that i want to look at is one that people have probably people that watch my channel probably watch a lot of debates or kind of back and forth about uh, the position of Mary. And they've probably heard of the Proto-Evangelium of James in that context. At least that's how I first heard about it. And so they might have this vague sense that the Proto-Evangelium of, like, uh, of James, it helps bolster some Marian claims, but then people retort that it's not canonical, and then it goes back and forth, and they're not really sure what to make of it. But if people don't have that background, or if they want a more full background than some later Marian debates, what's going on in this book? And again, why might we care? Yeah, yeah. So this is this is another book that has the uh, pseudepigraphy issue, because of course it, it acts as if it's written by St. James, uh, the brother of the Lord, right? So it's it's acting as if it's being written by a family member, and it's about the birth and early life of the Theotokos of Christ's mother, um, up to and including her giving birth to uh, Christ. And really, what it is is it is it is not uh, a sectarian document. So it is not the product of some particular group of Christians saying this is what separates us from the other Christians. Uh, it, what it really is, and it's, it's not a teaching document really, is it's a, it's an early written form of a whole series of traditions that predate it. Uh, and what I mean by traditions, I mean this very specifically, I mean the names of her parents, uh, Joachim and Anna, uh, that, uh, Joseph, uh, was an older widowed man to whom Mary was entrusted when she had to leave the temple. So this, the, the frame story real quickly is that it talks about uh, Saints Joachim and Anna. Her parents were very elderly, uh, similar to Anna's namesake, Hannah, the mother of Samuel. They prayed that they would be able to have a child even in their old age. God gave them a child. They brought her to the temple and gave her to the temple, again, much like Samuel, to live there. The time comes where Mary comes to physical maturity and needs to leave the temple, and so she's entrusted by betrothal to, uh, to St. Joseph, who is this older widowed man who has children from his previous marriage. Uh, and then uh, recounting the events leading up to the birth of Christ as they appear uh, in uh, Matthew and Luke's Gospels, and then giving some, frankly, very uncomfortable anatomical details about the birth and after the birth um, toward toward the end. Uh, but so these, these traditions of, like, these names and sort of the circumstance of her birth and Joseph's age – 
these are sort of traditions that were already around. Um, I'm really emphasizing this because sometimes you'll hear, oh, this comes from the Protevangelium of James. Well, if it's accurate, it comes from history, <laughs> right? And the earliest record we have of it is in the Protevangelium of James, the earliest written record that we so far have. And pretty much everybody writes the Protevangelium of James to around 125, 80, 125, sometime between there and 150. Uh, so I think it is it is validly used to show the antiquity of those ideas, right? Of that those names all the way back, uh, that these kind of things go back to the very early church, to people who lived within living memory of the people they're talking about um, and and the information that they're recording. Uh, and that's all without saying the text as a text has any kind of special authority. Uh, there are details in it that are certainly Gnostic tinged, right? That we wouldn't want to say are accurate by giving the text a ton of authority. But it is a, it is a written work that has that has these, these details in it. So I, I think it applies to those debates in a more nuanced way than it is usually applied to those debates uh, that, uh, that happen. But um, a lot of times people who come to an Orthodox church, I imagine the same is true with Roman Catholic churches. They may have the impression that Oh, all this Mary stuff is from the medieval period. Sort of in the Middle Ages, people went crazy, got into goddess worship or something, and this is all this sort of later stuff. But there, a lot of this on the theological side in St. Irenaeus uh, and other places, and some of this information in the Protevangelium of James goes back to at least the first half of the second century. Uh, and uh, is found there. And this is just sort of a piece of, of evidence of that. Thank you. And this has just been a wonderful little tour of various apocryphal works and what we might get out of them, how we might approach them. I trust that this has been helpful to people. I know it's been helpful to me. And selfishly, I get to do these interviews, not just for the people watching them, but for me. And it's truly such a pleasure to get to do it. And thank you so much uh, for coming back for a third time on this channel. Uh, really grateful for your time today, Father Stephen. Uh, I'd love to just leave off here um, with maybe just a quick Word of advice for people. Uh, one, they should buy the book. Um, they should definitely buy the book, which will be linked down below. Um, and we've talked maybe about some like the important kind of like hermeneutical uh, suggestions for getting into these or like understanding the background and all of these things. But maybe just in terms of the kind of like the, the posture that people approach these with as books, not just of like vague or like abstract interest, but as things that, you know, can actually help us, uh, that can be edifying for us. What would you suggest to people as they're going into these to, how, how should they be positioning themselves and approaching these books um, from more of like a hot, heart posture perspective as they're uh, getting ready to go on this adventure? Yeah, yeah, I, th I think these texts add a lot of richness to our understanding of the early Christian communities the preceding Jewish communities and the actual people who filled them and their way of being in the world, their way of seeing the world. Uh, a lot of times, even the new Testament can get reduced to kind of talking heads uh, and get kind of pulled out of history. Uh, St. Paul often gets read as, well, he's writing these doctrinal treatises and here's these points he's making. And, uh, and that takes away from the actual human St. Paul, you know, Saul of Tarsus, who lived and who had a certain education and who read these texts and who had these ideas uh, that formed a lens through which he read the Old Testament scriptures, through which he understood once Christ revealed himself to him, through which he understood Christ and the world around him and what uh, Christ's death and resurrection meant. Um, our, our forefathers and mothers in the faith were people like us, right? And uh, 
these are the things they were reading and the world they inhabited and the way they saw things. Uh, and I think that can really help break through sort of re-embodying them is something that can help really re-embody us because we tend to approach our lives the same way. We have sort of church stuff and our religious beliefs and, you know, those things here. And then all the stuff we have to deal with every day in our everyday life over here. And we don't integrate, integrate them for ourselves either. And I think helping to re-embody them can also help re-embody us in that way uh, and help us be more conscious about, you know, am I spending 90% of my time seeing things like a completely secular atheist materialist and then the other 10% as a Christian, um, you know, pulling that together, <laughs> right, and, and becoming more of a of a uh, an integrated person i think is actually something that these texts even though they're ancient even though the copies we have now are pulled out of some mon monastery library in the middle east uh is something that can can help us with modern life a lot more than we might intuitively think right off the bat what a wonderful place to wrap up that these texts can kind of reorient us to, to God's action in the world and to uh, re-embody, I think, was the language you used. I really appreciate that. Father Stephen, once again, thanks for your time today. And thanks to all of you for your time who watched this sometime in the future. I don't take that lightly. I'll wrap up as I always do by saying until next time, go uh, be on the lookout for more videos. But far more importantly than that, go out and love God and love others because truly above all else, that will change the world. Well, congratulations. You made it to the end of the video. I trust that means you enjoyed it. Thank you so much for your time. Hey, if you want to see more videos like this come out, you can support the channel by going to patreon.com slash gospel simplicity. And by supporting the channel, you allow me to spend more time on this, to have the equipment possible to do this, and to keep making videos to help the channel keep going and growing. You also get lots of fun perks like being in our Gospel Simplicity Inside Circle book club where we read the church fathers together. And that is just simply a blast. And you get that by signing up at any level. But hey, as just a little fun thing to let me know if you made it to the end of this video, if you made it to the end, just leave a comment. No one else will know what's going on, but just leave a comment saying, take that, Dan Brown. Uh, so if you made it, take that, Dan Brown. Love it. Uh, but I hope you guys enjoyed this video and uh, do be sure to check out Father Stephen DeYoung's stuff down uh, in the description below. Anyway, thanks so much for your time and God bless.